Welcome to this session. I'm Tim Spaulding, and this session is on behalf of EPISURF. And we're going to be talking about the epicellar mini metal implant in the knee and the ankle. I will be starting off first, and I'm joined by my colleague, Nick van Dijk. So I'm going to be talking about the epicellar implant in the knee, and I'll be looking at the indication technique and results in 80 patients at two years. And then my colleague, Nick, will be talking about treatment of the Taylor OCD lesions. What if the biological options have failed? So if I start off on use in the knee, I'm a surgeon in Coventry in England, and I'm presenting the results of a recently published paper on 80 patients at two years, along with the indications. And then essentially I'll show you the treatment and the technique for this. The starting point here is that we have this treatment gap between patients that are likely to benefit from the arthroplasty, unicompartmental or total knee at one end of the spectrum, and those that would be better off with the biological treatment at the other end of the spectrum. And in the middle, therefore, we have this gap, patients that are not yet ready for the knee replacement and are beyond the biological options. And I think that gap is really being a bit more clarified now with the options that we can use to treat. Many patients have had biological treatments and may now have um, poor outcome from that, and they've had this previous surgery. Essentially, with the EpiSurf, what I want to be able to show you that we have much more predictable implants now and predictable results. And that indication is becoming refined as we buy time before knee replacement. There are other treatment options in this field. There is the HemiCap from 2003. We have the biopoly implant from 2013 onwards. And then at the same time, the epicelar implant was developed with the solo as a single uh, implant and the twin as a larger implant. And this is from Episurf based in Sweden. Let me just run through what the system is to, be, to begin with. And this is an individualized mini implant system. The key part and the benefit to me is that we send the MRI scan to Episurf and then there is the damage report, which gives us the design and the manufacturer of this guide, as you can see in the middle of the screen here, where we have a 3D printed guide, which allows for the accurate implantation of the implant, getting, in, getting it to exactly the right height. And we can choose and decide that that is the appropriate size of guide and implant. The implant itself is made from cobalt chromium, with then on the underside HA on top of a, a titanium coating to enable that bony ingrowth. And it is then uh, shaped and individualized to the patient. Along with that come the disposable instruments which allow for accurate final positioning. And I'll show you that on the, on the video. The results then for this particular uh, patient then on a left knee medial femoral condyle is a guide that allows us to accurately see and align onto the defect and then implant the uh, specific epicelia. It's also possible to do a larger area, and here we see the damage marking report for a medial femoral condyle uh, requiring the uh, twin implant. And then when we see the final results at surgery, there's the guide, we've mapped it up exactly, it sits in the right place, and we have the larger implant covering the defect. Rehabilitation following surgery is essentially building up to full weight at four weeks. Free range of movement is allowed, there's no protection needed. And then strength work building once the pain and swelling is settled from about eight weeks. And I tend to have, uh, recommend avoiding impact activities that we know some people have got back to running. Now, if we can go through the results from this multi-center study, which is 80 consecutive patients in a series, and this was published in Castor, where you can see the final detail. It should be out very soon in published form. This was a prospective study with outcomes at 24 months in the group for focal defects, ICRS grade three or four. It's a single lesion on the femoral condyle, on the trochlear or the femur, not on the patella, and intact cartilage on the tibia with normal leg axis. And we define this in less than, less than three degrees out of alignment. We've collected data at three, six, 12, and 24 months, basing this on the Coos score and the visual analog score. And I acknowledge my co-authors in this work for this multi-center study. 
We have 75 in the particular study cohort, the five removed, two, um, two had revisions, one declined to be followed up and two had incomplete data. So we have complete data on 75 of a consecutive series. You can see the demographics here with 59% female, mean age of 48, and you see the range from 27 to 69, and the BMI at 28. 65% interestingly have had previous treatment, and this is going to be a common indication for the uh, epicelar implant. Um, many following microfracture, and you see mosaic plasty, ACI, the true fit plugs, and, and simple debridement before. On the right-hand side of the slide, we see where the implants have been placed with 40 solo implants on the medial femoral condyle, 25 twin, and then 10 on the trochlear, which can either be the solo or the twin implant. Looking specifically at the results, this is the results in a, in a nutshell, the whole group from the coups, the different domains of the coups and the visual analog score. So on the left-hand side here, we see the different domains. And then over the time points at three months, 12 months and 24 months with the pre-op scores down here. So you see a progression over time and an improvement for the pain, the symptoms, ADL, and then the sport scores and the quality of life scores. So this is reflected then in the visual analog score for pain with the pre-op pain reducing at three months, 12 months and 12 months, sorry, and, and 24 months. So there is an improvement that is maintained over time in these results across the consecutive series. We tried in this series to look at whether there's any difference in the implant type between the solo, the twin and trochlear, and essentially there is no significant difference. Now this study was not powered to detect a difference in those groups, but it's important to know at this stage whether there is a difference. It may appear there's a trend that the trochleas actually do slightly better at 12 months, 24 months, but that is not significant. You can see that essentially all are improved. And the visual analog score, again, there is improvement over time in that pain that is maintained across the three different implants, the solo, the twin, or the trochlear. We looked at whether there was a difference with previous cartilage treatment. It, it does appear that there may be a difference in the uh, primary cases, but this is not significant. And as we do more cases, you may understand that primary cases do indeed do better. But there is a range of patients who've had prior cartilage repair, and this hopefully is a very good option for those patients. So we will follow that out as time goes on. There are two patients that have had revisions. The first patient had um, an atypical lesion and there was a lot of bone marrow edema uh, preoperatively. There was no improvement after the implantation and that patient went on to have a unicompartmental knee replacement of 15 months. The second patient had previous oat surgery and was never really pain free and there were definite subchondral cysts. So a thicker implant was used. And again, there was no improvement unfortunately. And at 19 months, that patient was revised then by, by bone grafting an application of a chondroguide membrane. That was one of my patients, and I know that as, uh, after that, patients had a good, a good result. We've had one case who had an infection, which was revised after this series at 27 months, and two have had arthroscopy for release of scar tissue and one for mechanical clicking. So from the study, the conclusions there is that uh, this is an ongoing series. We know that there have been previous published results on this, and those results are variable and need to be improved on. This has been a select cohort analysis of 75 implants at two years where we have shown there is a low failure rate, there is good clinical improvement, and that individualized design seems to produce a very accurate fit with the instrumentation that allows it to be placed in exactly the right position. And the depth and the location for that is easy to achieve. And that is helped by this damage report at the beginning that allows a surgeon to actually confirm what they're going to be doing. So the focus then in the future is to understand the exact optimal indications for this technique. So let me show you that technique. This is the left knee medial femoral condyle we're going to do, just excising an old scar. And for the approach, medial parapatella, but then using a subvastus approach, which allows a wider um, field to enable insertion of the guide uh, to place it in exactly the right place. So this is the subvastus approach. 
Um, and then by inserting the appropriate instrumentation and the appropriate retractors to, uh, we can then reveal the damaged area. It's important to define that. And on this side, there is a damage marking report that we can see and marry up to it. So this is the actual EPI guide that is 3D printed and married up to the patient. And it sits amazingly well, exactly where we want it to go. It's very hard to then move it once it sits down and it's held in place by three pins that are again provided in the kit that comes with it. So there's minimal extra kit. These two are in parallel notes so that if we want to take the guide off, it can be slid over those two pins, removing the oblique one at the top right. Again, we're mapping out the area to know exactly that it has covered that area. So this is the first drill socket and the sharp pointed drill is then used to create the starting hole. The drill has a sleeve on it, so we drill into the right depth at that point. And that's marked at the top so that we can get the orientation correct. So once that is removed, then we insert the adjustment socket. And this is inserted at the zero point. And this is all worked out so that by that drill going, same drill going back in again, this should be down to the base exactly where we want it to be. So we've got the peg hole for the implant. Now we're taking the epi dummy to see exactly where it's sitting. And the aim here is to get to about half a millimeter below the articular surface. So I'm using the pin here, the reverse end, just to be able to feel. And if it's not right, if it's still flush or proud, then we use that same adjustment socket turn it to a different number and then drill again. Now they're marked in two, four, six. So that's 0.2 of a mil, 0.4 of a mil. So it's very easy to then dial this down to exactly the right depth. You can use the arthroscope to see that where the, the implant is at half a millimeter below the joint surface. I've marked the top of the site and this there is a small indent on the actual implant and on that epidemic as well so we can marry it up and see that it sits correct. Final check making sure it's half a millimeter below the joint surface and then insertion of the actual uh, implant using the epimandrel to uh, gently impact it into place noting that it will then be at half a millimeter below the surface and that completely then covers the defect according to the plan before through this mini approach. Closure is then um, as a surgeon would like to do with either uh, staples to the skin or subcuticular sutures. This is the final check for the implant in place. Tourniquet can be released and then closing the subvastus layer. So let's try and tie that all together. The indication I think now for focal resurfacing in, uh, in 2021 is this list here. So it's a focal lesion, it's pain compatible with the MRI. Um, the opposite surfaces, we do not want to be too worn. So ICRS grade two or less, we do not want bare bone on the opposite surface. On the PA30 standing x-ray, no loss of joint space. The meniscus volume, yes, we still need good meniscus. So 50% or more as a guide without extrusion and failure of the meniscus. No deformities in the bone, clearly no erosions. Deep cystic formation, that's going to be difficult. You can get a thicker implant um, requested, but it needs to completely be uh, supported on subchondral bone. Neutral alignment or within three degrees as we defined in the study. Appropriate patient expectations as always with uh, implants like this and not expecting them to go back to impact type activities. Acceptable BMI, non-smoking, sure those are um, sensible indications, normal ligaments and no metabolic disorders. So I do draw attention to the main website of episurf.com, which has more information about this and the published paper. And with that, I thank you for your attention, acknowledging all the co-authors in this study. And I would like to hand over to Nick van Dyke, who's going to talk to you about the TALUS. Thank you. Hello from Amsterdam. My name is Nick van Dijk and I'm presenting from home where I'm in quarantine due to a positive uh, COVID test. So I apologize upfront for my uh, throat. Here you see my affiliations and my uh, disclosure. I'm the editor in chief of the Journal of Isacos and consultant for EpiSurf. What's the problem? The problem is a localized osteogondal defect and the purpose of our treatment is twofold. 
It is to prevent osteoarthritis, but we know that the natural history is benign for the smaller lesions, which are typically 10 to 12 millimeter in size. The main reason for treatment is to resolve the patient's symptoms. And the main symptom of an osteogonda defect is deep ankle pain on walking. On the right, a schematic drawing of a knee joint, which is an incongruent joint, and the ankle joint on the left. 75% of the cartilage uh, is water, so on compression, the water in an incongruent joint goes into the joint space and on unloading, the water goes back into the cartilage. In a congruent joint, the water cannot go into the joint space and this will result in less compression of the, uh, of the cartilage. In the pathologic situation, there is a way out in a congruent joint. Um, it can go through the subchondral bone plate, the defects in the subchondral bone plate into the, into the subchondral bone. So on every step of walking, the water is compressed into the subchondral bone, leading to bone marrow edema um, on the uh, T2 image of the MRI, and finally to uh, cystic lesions, subchondral cystic lesions, which we see in congruent joints like the hip and the ankle, but not in incongruent joints like the knee. As when we look at treatments, then we see that the treatments that treat not only the cartilage but also the bone lead to the highest percentage of good excellent results. Theoretized bone marrow stimulation, oats, retrograde drilling and fixation uh, have the highest percentage of good excellent results. So the size of the lesion matters. And here we see uh, a typical uh, size lesion on the left, um, which now turned post-operative uh, because on the right you see um, a CT scan two weeks post-operative on the same patient and now this um, um, uh, nine millimeter lesion turned into a critical size 50 millimeter lesions. What does it mean? It means that the defect fills with uh, fibrocartilage which is not as firm as the, um, the, the adjacent hyaline cartilage so the load will now be on the edge. So this concept of edge loading is very important to remember, not only for um, uh, this type of treatment, but any type of treatment, osteogondal defect treatment, remember this aspect of edge loading. And indeed, one year later, in the same patient, we now see a cystic lesion, and it's not under this um, area uh, where the debridement has taken place, it is under this um, uh, edge of the original cartilage under the, the intact hyaline uh, cartilage. So schematically, here we see a lesion of uh, typically 10 millimeter. We debride it. It fills with fibrocartilage through the stem cells. The subchondral bone plate is restored. And this is then the situation. And 90% uh, of these patients have a good, excellent result, which lasts over time. However, in a larger size lesion, initially the same happens. It fills with stem cells, it fills with fibrocartilage, but now the load is on the edge of the defect, which might result in higher pressure, in tilting, and finally in a subchondral uh, cyst formation. If this continues, uh, the tilting can uh, get worse. You have more pressure also on the opposite side, maybe even on the medial or the lateral side, leading to cystic lesions also in those areas and finally a destructed joint. So how can we prevent it? We can prevent it by uh, um, um, uh, providing a filling of this um, defect which can take away the load on the edges. So for example, with um, a metal implant, it takes away the um, the load of the edge of the defect and protects the healthy cartilage. That's how basically it works. And here we see an, an example of such an implant which is placed at the level of the subchondral bone, which means that um, uh, on top of the uh, implant, the metal implant, we see hyaline cartilage and this helps to protect the edges. It acts as a filler as a spacer uh, to take away the load of the, of the edge of the defect. 
This is a case in which the um, metal implant is placed a little too proud and there we see um, uh, fraying of the cartilage on the opposite side. So it's better to place it a little lower rather than place it too proud. We published um, in 2018 the results of a first generation metal implant, um, 52 patients, 95% um, survival rate. The imperfections of this um, first generation implant was that the osteotomy depended on the skills of the surgeon and or you had to use image intensifier. There is only 12 uh, sizes of this hemicap available um, and uh, it is difficult to measure exactly the uh, contour and to, to check the contour of the talus because of the, the defect area and if you cannot have a good um, a view on um, an interpretation of the anatomy, then it's difficult to place it exactly right. The size of the screw is quite bulky, uh, which is um, uh, when you have to do a revision to um, an arthrodesis or a prosthesis, it is better to have a smaller stem or smaller screw. And there was no implant available for a lateral implant. Uh, a defect. The second generation metal implant, the AP sealer, um, has this um, osteotomy guide which is patient, patient specific, which is very helpful. It is custom made for the patient based on MRI or CT. The uh, guiding instrument is patient specific, which will result in a perfect fit. There is no large screw, but a, a small stem, and there is an implant available also for the lateral side. So the indication is a focal medial-lateral uh, tailor dome lesion of um, uh, 12 millimeter or, or, or larger, um, which leads to, uh, to, to symptoms. The preoperative planning is based on CT or MRI, and based on the CT and MRI, the guides are made, the guide for the osteotomy, and also the um, location of the lesion is determined exactly, as you can see on the left, and uh, um, the guiding instrument is, uh, uh, is made patient uh, specific. So here are the instruments, the specific um, uh, AP sealer, the specific guide, the specific osteotomy guide, and here you see the relatively simple um, uh, instruments. We will demonstrate the placement of an AP sealer talus in the left ankle. The patient is in the supine position and we operate in a bloodless field. The contour of the medial malleolus is marked on the skin and we start by an anterior artrotomy with excision of the anterior capsule. We place um, a Holman uh, retractor in order um, to protect the anterior uh, structures. And what we can also do is um, to place a small um, sharp Holman retractor into the distal tibia, this will um, uh, make it uh, necessary for an uh, assistant to hold it. Opening the retinaculum for the posterior tibial tendon and then with blunt dissection with this large size blunt um, uh, instrument, we go into the direction of the ostrigonum and then we can place a Holman to protect the neurovascular structures at the back of the joint. Then we place the uh, osteotomy guide, the patient-specific osteotomy guide, and we make sure that it fits onto the periosteum of the uh, distal tibia, and we secure it with two uh, two millimeter K wires. Then we pre-drill the two holes for the screws, which we will later on use to secure the medium layer osteotomy, and typically these are 2.5 millimeter drill holes. The uh, depth of the osteotomy, uh, we checked it with the osteotomy depth meter, and then uh, we protect the neurovascular bundles uh, in the front and at the back, and then we use the uh, osteotome, especially in the front and at the back, very careful not to go through the cartilage um, to finish the uh, osteotomy. After finishing the osteotomy, we can flip the medial uh, malleolus. We use a large osteotome initially and then with the two thumbs you will 
see that we can dislocate it. Then we will place um, two K wires, place it uh, away from the operating field in order not to interfere later on with the drilling. We place them for the Hintemann distractor. And you will see when we open the Hintemann distractor that we have good access to the talus. It helps to um, do a release of the posterior capsule um, uh, in order to have more opening of the joint. Then we will place the AP guide. There's only one position in which we can place the AP guide. Make sure the AP guide is flush with the cartilage surface and then um, we secure it with two K wires. The pin socket with a two millimeter K wire to drill a central hole um, which will accommodate the drill which we will later on uh, introduce through this drilling socket. Check that the socket has bottomed onto the AP guide and then we will uh, drill it. Use a lavage um, um, uh, to uh, take away any debris. And then the second step is the adjustment socket with the starting position, as is shown, the starting position, um, which will mean um, that the AP sealer will be flush with the cartilage if we would place it later on in this position. But this is how we start. Again, uh, make sure the uh, guide is, uh, the drill is flush with the uh, surface. And then we place the, um, the AP dummy. Check the mark here. marking on the AP dummy. Um, um, it has to fit like this. And then we will check the position the surface of the AP dummy and it should be, should be now flush with the cartilage anterior, posterior, medial and lateral. And then we can have a 0 0.2, a 0 0.4 or 0 0.6 millimeter uh, depth um, in relation to the cartilage. In this case we choose a 0 0.6, we place it, we drill it um, um, again, uh, flush it uh, in order to take away the debris, check if with the uh, AP dummy, if we are satisfied or if we have to go another 0 0.2 millimeter uh, lower. In this case, we are happy. Uh, so we mark on the skin the uh, rotation. And here you see that we marked, or not on the skin, on the cartilage, the uh, rotation. Um, and after removal of the AP guide, we can now uh, place the AP sealer. Make sure the rotation mark um, uh, is aligned with the marking on the cartilage and then by hand we can gently push it in and finally uh, with the AP mandrill we can secure it to its final position. Check if there is a 0 0.6 millimeter in this case um, position below the surface of the cartilage and when we are happy then we can close the osteotomy with some initial uh, compression like this. We placed initially uh, 2.5 millimeter K wires through the holes to secure the position and exchange it now for two 3.5 millimeter compression screws. 3.5 millimeter compression shoes, screws with short uh, windings in order to secure the compression. We are currently uh, performing a prospective multicenter uh, cohort study uh, on 25 patients uh, to assess the safety and proof of concept of the AP sealer talus. So, in summary, the pain comes from the bone, uh, treat the bone. Remember the concept of edge loading, it's important for all treatments of osteogonal defects. Check alignment, we didn't discuss it, but if the alignment is not good, any treatment will fail, also the implant of an AP sealer. And CT scan is the best for preoperative planning because the pain comes from the bone. And this finishes um, this presentation and this finishes the, um, uh, this symposium, this AP Surf symposium. I thank you for your attention.